Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think we need to say it a little bit louder. They can't hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very good. I'd like to welcome everyone today. It's a nice day out. It's sunny here in Dayton, Ohio. I think it's about 27, 28 degrees. Uh, we've been very lucky. We've missed all that snow, ice, and our hearts and prayers go out to those people that are in those areas. They're probably going to have a little hard time here for the next week or so. I'd like to welcome all the people that are watching us. Uh, if you'd like more information about our church, you can go to dlabc.org. You can watch us on YouTube or Facebook uh, by North Carolina American Baptist Church. I'd like to start off today, I started out with uh, I get up every morning about 4.55 a.m. Not because I want to, because I have two animals. I know the pastor always talks about his dog. We have two cats, and they like to be fed around 5.10. So about 5 till or 10 till 5, they start in. I would get a headbutt from one if I don't get up. The next one, the male cat comes in, and I hear the, feel this wet nose in my ear. So I'm up, feed them, throw in some old clothes, and I go to McDonald's every morning for breakfast. And I usually get a bacon sandwich or something like that. And then I go through the drive through get the breakfast, pull into the slot, and I like to listen to this one minister. It comes on about 6.15 on one of the stations here in Dayton, Ohio. And he was telling a story that I thought I would bring to you. And it's about this little boy. And some of you have children or grandchildren or just know children. Sometimes I'll say something so profound, you wonder where they came from. Well, what it was is a little boy, he was totally lost. I mean, he was lost. He was devastated. He had the quivering lips, shapes, tears coming down. So if you ever lost somebody or really depended heavily on somebody, and all of a sudden, for some reason, they're not around you anymore. You get that, you have that feeling. Well, there's two officers there, and they're trying to get some information from him. They said, hey, uh, do you know where your phone number is? Or do you know what your phone number is? He says, no. Well, do you know your address? No. So the two officers looks kind of flex, and the second officer says to the little boy, says, well, there's any information you can give us maybe around where you live, a house, a tree, anything. And the little boy thought for a little bit, and all of a sudden this big smile came across his face. No more tears, eyes clear as a bell. And he says, do you know where the church is? There's a big cross out in front of it. And the first officer looked at the second and said, yeah, we know where it's at, it's right down here. It says that cross must be 50 feet high by 30 feet wide. And the little boy looked up at the police officer and he said, if you can get me to the cross, I can find my way home. Kid nailed it. <laughs> the boy says, Christ is calling us today. He's knocking on our door. Let us pray. Lord, we direct this worship time to glorify in your name. We thank you for the everlasting truths that guide us day by day. We thank you for the living word of Jesus Christ. We thank you all you have given us. As we go about our daily lives this coming week, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit into our lives. God, your hand reaches out to all brokenness, to soothe all pain, to wipe away all tears. We pray for your children who are victims of violence and oppression in this world. Grant them courage and hope. We pray in the spirit of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand if you're able, and we will sing hymn 612 in this very room. Today's scripture reading is Haggai from chap all of chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Transition. Transition. <clears throat> On August 29th of the second year of King Doriah's reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, governor of of Judea and Joshua, son of Jehozadak. This is the word, this is what the Lord of the heaven army says. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the Lord sent his message to the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in the luxury's houses while my house lies in ruins. This is what the Lord heaven army says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of heaven army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for a rich harvest, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies. While all of you are busy building your own fine houses, it's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees 
and all your other crops. A drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, and Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people began to obey the message from the Lord, their God. And when they heard words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, governor of Judea, and the enthusiasm of Joshua, son of Jeho excuse me, Jehozadak, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of their God. The Lord of Heaven's armies on September 21st of the second year of King Darius's reign. So ends our scripture reading. Please stand while we sing our doxology in preparation for the dedication of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. receive and bless these tithes and offerings which we offer in response to your steadfast love as your son Jesus transformed people's lives so may the lives of others be transformed through these gifts through your love and through our witness in Christ's name we pray amen I guess we're still standing, right? Okay, so we're going to sing this hymn 390, verses 1, 2, and 4. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart.
We're going to turn to uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 10. Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was short and he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, uh, your word. We pray for inspiration. Pray that our hearts will be open to the message that you have for us, the reminders in your word of your goodness, of your love, and of your grace, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just wanted to, uh, to, to look with you at this theme of a godly response. We talked last week, as I mentioned, that our New Year's resolutions are not going to accomplish necessarily God's purpose, but our response to God accomplishes God's purpose. And so it's a godly response to the activity of God that God does something through us, not that we're doing something for him, but it's what he does through us. And so with that, the, the first point I'd like to make is that God wants to meet with us. God wants to meet with us. Now we had uh, this first song here. What is entitled in this very room? And Jack picked this out. And so the, the theme of that song is that God wants to meet with us in this very room. Now the question is, do we believe that God wants to meet with us? Do we act on that belief? Do we respond to God's desire to be with us? And in some ways I think sometimes we do and other times I see I'm probably not responding as often as I ought to to God's call to come together to meet with him. And so, so I want to consider uh, Zacchaeus because, uh, you know, we sing songs about Zacchaeus. It's, we leave it to the children sometimes. I think there's uh, maybe not the message for the adults, but uh, some of the best children's stories are the messages that the adults need as much as the children do. And so Zacchaeus is an incredible individual who gave up his position in life, gave up a lot of his power in life, and uh, here he was as a distinguished individual with money, and he's out climbing trees. <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't the thing to be done to out, go out and climb a tree as a wealthy man or a Jewish man, it was kind of a disgrace for him to go out and do this very thing. But he knew this, God was coming. Jesus was coming this way and he was willing to position himself. So first is that he positioned himself to meet up with God. Sometimes that's uh, you know what we have to do when we say, God, I want to meet with you. I need to take a position that I'm ready, I'm here and able and ready where you're going to come and meet me. Whether it's in this very room, whether it's in our prayer closet, 
whether it's at a convention or some, some kind of concert where we say, I'm looking for an encounter with God. He will be there. I want to meet with him should he come. I want to see him. Well, Zacchaeus was willing to do this and to, uh, to take some heat from the community. It's like, look at this ridiculous man. He's climbing a tree. It's, you know, what you do as a kid, it's not what you do as a grown man. And so Jesus came by, and we see not only was Zacchaeus positioned to meet with God, but the posture of his heart was as a humble man. It kind of takes a bit of humility to position ourselves to meet with God. We might do something to say, hey, I, I want to find this time with God, and someone in your family or your community might make fun of you for doing the very thing that would allow you to be in the presence of God. And they're like, what are you doing? And certainly the questions were, what are you doing? And they didn't just stop at like Zacchaeus is ridiculous, but they're like, Jesus is ridiculous. Like, why is Jesus meeting in the house of a sinner? And, and so God gets mocked along with us. And so uh, here he was, he poured out his heart saying, I'll, I'll pay back four times. I will give half of my money away. I'm not interested in the position that I have in this world. I'm looking at what the kingdom has for me. And he was willing to make that change. So he was willing to consider, Jesus, I need to be in your kingdom, not just in this world. You know, the question is, are we... Are we preparing to meet God? Do we have a meeting place that we think that God might come and we're taking a response to, to do that? And when we look through uh, the reading of the prophet Haggai, it's interesting because in, in this, the prophet Haggai was among the first to speak to the exiles who were coming back from Babylon, was taken over by Persia. And so the, the former temple that Solomon had built was in ruins. It was gone. It was destroyed. And so there was no temple, no meeting place for God's people to meet. And so when the people came back, what did they learn in the years of captivity, the generations before? Well, what we saw was they were building their own houses, but they weren't building the meeting place with God. I think it's, it's easy for us to understand that God's meeting place is with us. We are his house. And so it's not so much the physical that we're trying to come up with, but in our lives, are we building that meeting place? In our schedule, in our time, in our thoughts, are we saying, God, I am looking to meet you today, and I know that you're willing to come. I know that you speak to my heart, do I listen to you? Am I willing to listen to what you might say in your word or in my prayers? Am I just uttering things up to you, but I'm not hearing what you might have to say? And so that listening phase is really important. The exiles, uh, God's blessing, some of that is grace and some things are conditional. If you follow the wisdom of God, you find the fruit of wisdom. If you follow the, the obedience of, of the scriptures, of what God teaches, there are blessings that come that don't come any other way. And here it was that to the exiles coming back, he said, you planted much, harvested, harvested little. You eat, never have enough. You drink, never have your fill. You put your clothes on, and you are not warm. You earn your wages and only to put them in a purse as though it has holes in it. There is fruit that comes from the wisdom of obeying God and saying, God, I'm going to set you apart as first, and then you'll have more than enough, and then you'll have satisfaction. If you chase after everything but God, there will not be satisfaction in your heart. The things that you know, I don't, I don't get no satisfaction. I, you know, it's, it's not coming if we're not 
chasing after God. The contentment comes in seeking him first, but the blessing also comes in seeking him first, and he will bless us. Uh, so the people responded, and God said this, I am with you. I am with you. Here in this room, here in this place, here in this temple. And so the, the call had gone out to build the house of the Lord, and it was the governor and the high priest who responded. It's like, yeah, we're going to build that. And we read through later in this book, and they started to build it. But Solomon's temple was pretty grand, and then this temple was not so much as grand. And so even in the response, it's like, yeah, we're going to do this, but they didn't fully give themselves over at that point. And then we read through several of the other prophets, and we see what has happened in this. And the question isn't so much, is God going to come and bless? But in uh, Zechariah, the question is put back to them. Are you going to respond in a way? Are you going to be a people who respond in a way that God wants to come and bless? And so with that, we see that uh, it wasn't until Herod built the temple that the temple had been to a, the kind of glory that a temple ought to have. But we already saw the problems of Herod. <laughs> He wasn't, he wasn't truly seeking God. And we find in the midst of all of our response, God is more gracious than we are faithful. God is more gracious than we are faithful. But we've got to be looking for the opportunity for God to meet with us. I wanted to uh, just reflect a bit as well in the same theme. There was a revival in, in the country of Wales in 1904 and 1905. And at the center of the revival, there were many preachers and, and all, but there was a young man, Evan Roberts was his name. And he had, he had grown up in a poor house. He, at the age of 12, became a coal miner and he would go down into the coal mines and working there. And as was the case in coal mines, they weren't safe. They didn't have OSHA. I don't know that I would want to work in a coal mine today. I know someone that does, but, uh, you know, and the money's good, but I don't think that I would want to work there still today. But in that, there was an explosion. And he had a Bible with him. that I can't imagine trying to read a Bible down in a coal mine in 1904 or earlier. This was actually in the 1800s still because he was young. And the Bible got singed, but yet he felt that God was speaking to him. And at the age of 13, he became a believer, gave his life to Christ and prayed for revival. He wanted a God encounter. He thought that he was in a study in church and someone said, what if God comes, like in this very room, what if God comes and you're not here? And that really stuck in his heart. And he's like, I don't want to miss the opportunity. So, like, we could say the same thing. What if the governor's coming here? What if a president, what if some leader? And we'd say, oh, well, I'm going to come here. I'll, I'll make sure I'm here when he's coming. But it's like, he got fixed on the idea, what if God is coming to do an incredible work, and I'm not there to be a part of it? And he wanted me at the center to, to respond to him. And so even as a teenager, other kids would go off and play soccer, they call it football over there. They would go off and do all this, and, and he would say, I've got to go to church, I've got to be in prayer, I've got to be in study. And so for 13 years, he was seeking an encounter with God. They had a revival about 50 years prior to this, and he was looking for another revival where God would come and do incredible things. And he was faithful to that task. He eventually uh, went to college, and his, his family sent him there. And he's like, the only thing that I have interest in, because he was praying for God encounters, and in the middle of the night, God would wake him up at three in the morning. And he said it was like 
as though I had this time with God. And it was happening day after day, and he had these encounters, and someone said, did you write anything down? He's like, no. But I had this incredible encounter that I felt like God was sitting in the room with me. And so he, he believed that God was going to meet them in church. And so he continued in his prayers, and he felt it was very important to listen to the Spirit, to say, well, should I say something, or should someone else? And he was in one prayer meeting, and person after person was praying until he said, I, I felt like I was going to explode if I didn't say something. And he came out, and he, he shared, and people described that in, in that and in other encounters, that there was a very dynamic presence of God in their prayer meetings. It was, it was really an incredible thing because his prayer was bend the church. Bend me was his prayer, but also bend the church and save the world. And he recognized that in revival, the church needs to change as much as the world needs to change. Our readiness, our expectation that God would meet us needs to increase if we're going to see the world change. It wasn't just the world that they were concerned with. And so he had some, he had a sermon that he would preach. And there were incredible things that happened with that. Some of it was some healing and others were different things that people were ready to confess sin. And his, his sermon was four conditions. If, if the outpouring of God's spirit was going to be there, he said, confess all known sin. We can't hide it from God. If, if we're going to look for God's presence, God is holy, we've got to confess our own error. And so confess all sin, put away disputable or doubtful things, and forgive everyone. So we're getting right with our relationship with God. We're getting right with our relationship with each other. And then he said to have complete and immediate obedience to the Holy Spirit. If God tells you to do something, don't wait. Do that very thing right now. And then to publicly confess Christ as Savior. And this is the message that he went around and preached. It was incredible because what the historians observed was that the church services had become cold and formal until this breath of God's fresh air had come in and they realized that God was in their presence and they waited, services ran long and they didn't really care. They were like, does this guy prepare for a message or does he not? Because he came out and he shared some things and they said, it was as though he knew things about people in the congregation and that there was disputes about it. And so they wrote about it in the newspaper. It's like, what do you think about this guy? There was no recordings or anything else. And then everybody, more and more people came out. And he went around and making a circuit around Wales. He had had a vision that God was going to give 100,000 people uh, salvation. And he said it in his vision, it was like Jesus wrote as though it were a check. 100,000 and handed it to God the Father. In this revival, they counted 100,000 people in Wales that had come to know Christ. Just an incredible thing. And there was confession, there was repentance, people stayed true. To, they said 80% of the people five years later were still walking in this faith. It wasn't just an event that they went to. It wasn't just a controversy. And here's, here's what they said, how the impact was felt in society. They said that gambling lost money. Some of the, some of the pubs where alcoholism had been a, a tremendous problem lost some of their businesses. Brothels were closed. Well, I didn't know they had brothels in in 1905, but apparently they had brothels in Wales, and they, they closed. Outstanding debts were paid. 
Sporting events were canceled. A lot of the people playing in the sporting events said, no, I want to go to church because I, I see that God is moving and I don't want to miss this opportunity. And so for that period of time, they said, no, this is more important than what we're doing in these games. They said that judges were presented white gloves because there were so few cases to try. It's just incredible. They said an illegitimate birth rate was reduced by 44%. And, and so you see, and, and my favorite was this. In the mines, the mules had to be retrained because they only knew how to respond to the profanity that was in the mines. And so the mules had to be retrained for people saying, I want to speak with more conscience about what comes out of my mouth. And then the mules didn't know what to do. It's incredible. It didn't just end with whales, but it impacted this nation as well. In the Denver Post in January 20th, 1905, they wrote, the entire city pauses for prayer, even at the high tide of business. And so there was a fascination at that point with getting in touch with the living God who wants to meet with us. In Portland, Oregon, of all places, 240 department stores signed a covenant agreeing to close their doors from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. while their customers and the employees wanted to attend some prayer meetings because the presence of God was moving at that time and in their midst. In the Atlantic City, out of a population of 50,000, the ministers counted up and they were like, they could only find 50 adults who were not Christians out of a population of 50,000. God was moving in a powerful way. Now, Evan had had waited 13 years to see what God would do. But he came to that, and he came afterwards. He didn't pursue a, a career as a professional minister, but he did stay involved in prayer and the idea that God wants to meet with us. Who knows what God wants to do? But we do know this. He wants to meet with us. And, and if God indeed meets with us, it will impact us, our family, and inevitably some other people will see the difference in us that they can say, I want a part of that as well. Because I want to know this living God who loves me, cares about me, forgives my sin. Some of the people criticized Evan Robertson. They said, well, he's... He's just being an exhibitionist or something like that. And yet he himself said, all that I believe that we need to do is to get together to worship God. And he will come and be with us. It's not, not a bad concept in our response to a God who says, I stand at the door or not. If anyone opens the door, I'm, I'm coming in and I'm going to share with you. I'm going to eat with you and it's going to be good. And so uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the examples in Scripture about how you love us. It's not just to Zacchaeus. It's not just to Evan Roberts. It's not just to your people coming back from exile. But we, we just want to be ready for you to have an encounter with us that changes us in the world, that you bend us and you reach the world with your love. There's nothing better than your love in this world. Help us to remember that, to speak that, and to share your love. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go to hymn number 575, verses 1 and 3.
there is much need at this point in our culture and in the world to find leadership, love, wisdom, guidance, direction at any point in history. Now is the time that we need a king. And so we count on you because you are the one who holds it all together. You lift up nations and you tear them down. You allow us to see the fruit of our choices, but you call us to the fruit of your wisdom. And so we ask that not only for ourselves, but for those who follow, for those who watch, for those who may not have interest yet, that you bend us, help us to lean toward you and not uh, to our own way. We seek you out that we might uh, make you known to the nations. And so we ask you to help us in our service as your servants to this world. We pray in Christ's name, amen. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.